I'm Glenn McGuinness, and this is Outburst. On the program, will carbon pricing affect how you vote in the next election? So you, it you, definitely will affect uh, who I'll be voting for, depending on what stance they take. I'm a liberal voter, but I'll definitely uh, not vote liberal because of the carbon tax. It, it's ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. There are many other issues that uh, I think are uh, more important to me. But first, recently British Columbia Premier David Eby's government tabled a bill looking to make social media giants legally responsible for what he calls harms caused to people and especially youth. Eby says young people are suffering from depression, anxiety and even eating disorders because of algorithms and other elements tied to social media. And the bill is also looking to hold companies who manufacture vapes and even energy drinks responsible for the potential harms their products could cause to people. So, do you think this is the right thing to do? Our question. Do you agree with BC suing social media giants for alleged harms caused on their platforms? I do not agree in suing, in British Columbia, suing the um, social media platforms because at the end of the day, we all have free will and we choose to do whatever we want to do on each platform. Although there are guidelines that prevent certain things from happening, I don't think they have the um, capacity or ability to completely eradicate like uh, wrong things from happening. People are people. I don't agree with government suing uh, any press, and to me that comes under the umbrella of press, social media. I'm a true believer in freedom of the press just because you don't like what you hear uh, doesn't mean you should take legal action. Now, it's a bit of a fine line too. I mean, if it is, uh, you know, if it's truly uh, against the law what they've done, I can somewhat understand it, but I'm, I'm a real believer in, uh, I don't like the press to be suppressed. I want the press to be free in Canada. I'm sorry to say, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, people are gonna say whatever they're gonna say online. It's a, it's a total trash bin out there. And if uh, we could sue everybody uh, for everything they say, um, it, we wouldn't be living in the real world. So I kind of think that's ridiculous, personally. Yes, it's totally out of control. Uh, people are totally, that are putting those things out, totally irresponsible. There's no control over it. And uh, yes, if the British Columbia government can sue them and keep them from putting out harmful information, then yes, go for it and other provinces should be doing the same thing. You know, when using social media platforms, you need to be aware of the inherent risks um, that come along with those platforms. So I don't think it should be kind of a, a legal pressing matter. I think kind of that platform should stand alone um, and those using the platform um, should kind of know the risks. It's, it's, a, it's an expensive way to deal with the issue at hand, particularly. I'm not totally against it, but I think it will be difficult to enforce. I think that how do you prove actual harm that the company was actually, you know, uh, contributed because they'll, they will have very good lawyers and uh, very good defense. And, uh, you know, is that really the best way to spend our money to protect particularly young people? I think BC should be able to, if a company is causing a public health issue, BC has, should be able to sue them for that. I would say yes, um, because there's often no other recourse for families and somebody needs to take responsibility. Well, if the harms are detrimental to the uh, populace, okay, uh, that, that, that could be, that could be a, an avenue for them to pursue, but chances are it wouldn't work because it would interfere with, the, probably interfere, I'm not a lawyer, with uh, human rights and uh, freedom of speech and all these other kind of things. Go after those individuals, not the company itself. It's, it's, it's politics. So, yeah, no, I don't agree with E.B. saying what he said. No, he can't do that. I don't think he can. He just waste more time trying to pursue it than you would, uh, yeah, time and money. That could be better spent on social housing trying to get people off the street. Like, we really need to get people off the street, not dealing with computers. Yes, I would uh, agree with that. Yes, they should be held. What? Uh, uh, because they simply have too much power 
uh, to uh, uh, exercise uh, uh, in the absence of oversight and, uh, and in their access to s small children or teenagers. I guess it really depends on the social media and what actions they've taken against uh, like these kinds of harms that could happen to minors. If they've taken action, they've tried to prevent it in, uh, in legitimate ways, then I don't think they should be able to. But uh, if the social medias have been willingly negligent and allowing minors through either advertisement or other forms to be uh, harmed, then yeah, absolutely, if we can show that. Uh, I mean, I don't know much about the case where, where they're suing those companies, but I do think it's good that people are trying to address the harm or potential harm that uh, these platforms are doing to, to children, to, to young people. Um, I have two young kids myself, and I know that it's, it's scary to think about uh, them engaging in these social medias in ways that we never did when we were younger. So I think it's you know important to look into it. I don't know much about the, the court cases, though, so I can't really comment on that. Personally, I think social media is a disease. <laughs> And I think the more that you can keep your kids off of it, the better. But I, I, again, as far as making Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg responsible for your own actions is kind of lame. They don't necessarily cause the harm, but it, you can make a case that they facilitate it by putting people who are being harmed into contact with people who are harming them, right? Uh, I think so because they uh, they have a you know a responsibility to uh, protect kids. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if uh, suing them uh, is a, a way to kind of beat them over the stick t for, that, for that to happen, then uh, I, think, uh, I think it's okay. And besides, they're like multi-billion dollar corporations, so I, I, they, they, can, uh, they can pay up. <laughs> TikTok has also been receiving some negative news coverage as of late. Both U.S. lawmakers and Canadian security officials feel that since the app's parent company is Chinese-owned, it poses a serious security and privacy threat to both countries because it collects so much sensitive data. But the app is wildly popular in the U.S. and here in Canada, and some people feel getting rid of it undermines free speech. Many people are for the ban, and many people strongly oppose the ban. So which side are you on? Our question. Should TikTok be banned in Canada? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, I'm leaning more on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is banned and 1 is, is absolutely left to their own devices. I'm sort of a 7.6 um, because I have an account, but uh, only because I'm on Apple, where I feel like it can be sandboxed. I don't like the idea that China would have such ubiquitous access to Canadian data because we're not um, we're not really trusting of each other right now. And so in a relationship that doesn't feel like it's based on trust, it makes me feel very uncomfortable for them to have that access. But I have it because I'm finding it the most wonderful tool for people to share their stories. And I've learned so much through watching Indigenous TikTok as an example um, ab about the barriers people face. And it's helped really help me to be active in my community and understand how to support others. So uh, do the benefits outweigh the harms? I'm not sure, but I have it today. And uh, if it wasn't sandboxed, I probably wouldn't have it on my phone. No, I don't think they should be banned as long as they follow the rules. If they're breaking the rules, well, that's a, that's a whole other issue, and uh, then they should be looked at and uh, uh, disciplined. I don't think it should be banned. It makes sense to put pressure on TikTok to store more of the data in Canada and create a bit of a firewall, but I think a ban is a bit too far. I think I would have to trust the government because I know that they've done the research on it, and if it's been going on long enough and if they feel that our um, sharing would be used for nefarious purposes then yes again that's like a it's a pretty hard question um, I'm not exactly sure all the research or data that we have behind showing that TikTok may be uh, engaging in any sort of like um, operations here in Canada or um, how they're manipulating um, people through TikTok, but if they can be shown to be doing that, then yeah, absolutely. If it's uh, if it's an affecting Canadians in a negative way, then yeah, it should be banned. But uh, if it isn't and it's just operating as a normal social media platform, then I guess it should just stay. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I uh, I mean, I'm not on TikTok, so I've never I've never used the app, so I don't know much about it. Uh, it seems like 
you know, banning it because it's owned by China while, while letting, you know, Twitter or, or X and Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff kind of run free doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't really see more damage coming from one social media platform than another. I'm not an expert, obviously, but it, it seems maybe more political than actually useful. Absolutely. Because you don't know what that China, Chinese government is doing with that application. It's the same reason why we should, shouldn't have Huawei phones anymore. It's like, or, or, or fifth generation technology for our internet connections. You have absolutely no idea what's going on behind the scenes. This is powerful networking. And again, unless you, have, don't, have full, you don't have full control over it, you, but uh, basically a communist government does, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I would not trust it. Yes, I, I don't like TikTok uh, being uh, uh, controlled by a, a hostile foreign country. And I regard China as a hostile foreign country. You think we should we be better off without TikTok in Canada? Uh, oh yes, I do. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the r recent revelations of um, uh, of uh, election interference that are in the headlines today and yesterday uh, make me highly suspicious of uh, uh, PRC activity in uh, North America. Uh, I don't really use TikTok, and uh, uh, it seems to be that it's like uh, kind of like used by the Chinese to uh, you know undermine uh, our democracy, and uh, I'm very much against that. So uh, yeah, I think that's okay. I think that more needs to be looked into for that because they're they're looking at the states, what's going on there, and I think there's going to be some interesting uh, things that will surface from that, and then. Once that's done, then Canada will probably follow suit in any case. I don't think it should be banned. I don't think TikTok should be banned because uh, besides the fact that it creates a monetary, uh, uh, um, like a means of livelihood for individuals, is also a point of uh, entertainment. And it also has served better means of reaching younger people with the news better than the news stations nowadays so I don't think it should be banned. Yeah I don't think TikTok should be banned in Canada. I mean it's a great social media platform where tons of users uh, kind of share their experiences and a lot of um, you know popularity comes from that app and and things are discovered like viral recipes and kind of um, you know learning about influencers and I think it's a great social media app that um, you know would be sad if it were to be banned or removed. I'm not a big fan I don't use it often. Um, I understand uh, the majority owner is um, China uh, and there's a lot of data collection, uh, privacy issues and whatnot. Um, I don't know if it should be banned. Uh, I think maybe perhaps the ownership should change and then if not, uh, perhaps it doesn't belong here. You know, I do understand it's a Chinese company. You know, <laughs> there is concerns, 100% there is concerns. but. Uh, you know, governments should always try, at least in my opinion, to find ways to work with each other and not, uh, not uh, punch down on each other, you know, because to me it just sounds like, uh, okay, TikTok is a Chinese company primarily, you know, the parent company is Chinese and it's like, it's a security risk. Yes, I get it, but uh, yeah, there is uh, nuances to it for sure. So I think further dialogue needs to be had on that one before just banning it. Who was the Prime Minister of Canada during World War I? Sir Robert Borden, Sir Charles Tupper, Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Borden, Tupper, or Laurier? Laurier. It is Laurier. I'm 90% sure Laurier. 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 Borden, Tupper, Laurier. Tupper. Laurier. I would say, I don't know. <laughs> Laurier. 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 Okay, I'll go for it. i go, I'll go. Laurier? I have no idea. <laughs> Laurier. Borden. Absolutely correct. Fist pump. That's it? That's okay. it. Okay, all right. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir Robert Borden served as Canada's eighth prime minister from 1911 to 1920. While in office, he led Canada through the First World War and the immediate years following. His decision to invoke conscription in 1917 to maintain Canada's forces overseas during the war deeply divided the country. 
but Sir Robert Borden played a large role in establishing more autonomy for Canada and other nations in the Imperial Commonwealth, laying the groundwork for Canada's independence. According to the Prime Minister, Canada is letting in too many temporary immigrants at a rate that he feels is almost impossible for this country to absorb. Trudeau said that back in 2017, the temporary immigrant population in this country stood at 2%. Well, seven years later, that number has more than tripled. But even though Canada relies heavily on temporary foreign workers, Immigration Minister Mark Miller says it's still time to reevaluate the system. But he added that construction workers and healthcare workers are an exception to the rule. So what do you think about this? Our question. Is it necessary for Canada to decrease the temporary resident population from 6.2% to 5% over the next three years? We need to, if, as long as they're temporary and don't overstay, if we need them to come here and help with whatever it might be, then we need them. When we don't need them, we don't need them. If we need 3% to get the job done, we need 3%. If we need 10% to get the job done, we need 10%. But temporary is the key. You come here as a temporary worker, then you get out. I think uh, I think houses are expensive, and I think the job market is overpopulated. And uh, I think the more people that come in, the more expensive the houses are going to be, and the harder it is going to be to find a good job. And uh, I think we should take care of our indigenous populations before we start caring for other peoples and populations. We don't need to import, we got to take care of our own people. Can we sustain it? Do we have Do we have the ability to put people in places like we're, look at our town, like we have so much homelessness and, and it's not just in Kelowna, you know, it, it's very widespread. So maybe if they did include the provinces a little bit more and got us involved and got us talking a little bit more, maybe we could facilitate and come up with something that's a little bit more sustainable. I think um, our country needs more immigration, but we need to do it correctly and just kind of have like, oh, Syria is having an issue. Let's just take all these people in, right? That's jumping the line. There is a process that you have to do. Um, I know that we bring a lot of like temporary workers in to do wines, like work in the orchards and stuff, and at a lower rate of pay than we pay. So we need those for those businesses to survive. And I'm cool with that, but um, we'd be smarter about it, not just let whoever in and cut the line. There is a process for a reason. But yeah, no, Canada is a country built on immigration and we have so much space and need more growth. So I don't think it's necessary to lower the amount of people that are here. Why not? Well, I think, like I say, other than the housing issue, I think it's perfectly fine to have the population that we do. More people will help more taxes and more options. I think uh, people coming from other countries are what's making this country good, in my opinion. They do the jobs that... Other they start off uh, and work their way up. I'm all for them. Bring them in. More the better. I don't know. It's not something that I've researched, but uh, we do have a serious housing crisis. Uh, but again, we also have a unskilled labor um, shortage as well. So I think temporary foreign workers uh, are important to bring into this economy to keep our economy running. Well, depending. Well, for myself, I'm a small business owner, and I'm currently trying to bring someone into the country, into Newfoundland help my company that I can't find a Canadian to do. So, yeah, I think so. They're bringing in new people, fine, not around, a lot of people leaving, bring them in, but try to even it out, right? So, right now we're, we're to a point where the housing is a shortage, everything's a shortage here, and nobody seems to do anything about it. They talk about it, but they're not doing anything about it. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think right now, we need more immigrants here to take over for the jobs that are vacant. There's a lot of vacant jobs here, and a lot of younger people don't want to be in uh, fast food and whatever. No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, Canada uh, is a great place to live, and if people want to come and uh, work here uh, and, and, you know, partake in our uh, democracy and our culture and contribute their own cultures and all that multicultural exchange, go for it. Um, you know, we, we do need more housing. Uh, and uh, by keeping people out, I, I don't think that's going to solve the housing crisis. We should be welcoming people into Canada because it's so beautiful and wonderful country to live in. 
I think that we need the workers that we need to do certain jobs that some people don't want to do, right? And, and temporary foreign workers play a huge part in that. Um, the conditions they're living through right now don't seem, to, from what I know, to be putting any pressure on the housing situation because they, they, they live in, 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 sometimes in squalor, right? So it's, it's not, uh, no, I, I don't think that they should be, that the numbers should be reduced, to be honest. Uh, yes, uh, except that if our crops aren't picked <laughs> and uh, other, other uh, uh, economic activities are uh, uh, greatly hindered by the absence of labor, then uh, that should be revised. Uh, it depends what they're thinking of replacing it with. I know that there's been a lot of issues with uh, the temporary for foreign workers programs, um, including very importantly to me, like the, the, the human rights abuses that a lot of these workers face. Uh, you know, they, they're here working without as many rights as, as those of us who are from here get. So I think, you know, if, if they're thinking of replacing the program with something a little bit more humane, a little bit more better for, for the workers themselves, I, I welcome it. Uh, I'm not sure what their, what their rationale for decreasing that number is right now. It seems like there's always a need for more workers in Canada, so I'm not sure you know, limiting workers coming in is necessarily the, the solution, but I think if, if that program is to continue, then those workers coming here to work definitely deserve much better labor protections, labor rights, human rights, uh, like we all do here. Carbon pricing, or the carbon tax, depending on who you're talking to, has been a polarizing topic in this country for quite some time now. It puts a price on carbon emissions, and that price went up on April 1st by $15 per ton, leaving the total at $80 per ton. The federal government says rebates will help offset what people pay, but critics still think that carbon pricing will make inflation and the cost of living higher. Also, several provincial premiers have been pressing the federal government to get rid of the tax, with Ontario Premier Doug Ford going as far as saying if the federal Liberals don't get rid of it, they're going to pay during the next election. The Prime Minister replied it's not his job to be popular. So will this affect you when you go to vote? Our question. Will carbon pricing affect how you vote in the next federal election? Yeah, it will definitely affect how I vote, the carbon tax. I'm a Liberal voter, but I'll definitely uh, not vote Liberal because of the carbon tax. I have a son that just started a trucking company, and the price of fuel already is, is extreme. But we all know that the end amount of money spent gets put on to the end user, you and me. So yeah, definitely I will not vote for the Liberals with the carbon tax. First time ever. Because I feel like uh, we're taxed to death as it is. We don't need a tax anymore. No. I'm going to vote for Trudeau and his crowd, regardless. Why? Well, I like him. He's better looking than most. But he's not going to be there. He'll be gone. Somebody else will be in there. No, it won't. Uh, I drive electric vehicle, so it's actually a benefit for me. Honestly, I haven't given it that much thought. Um, uh, I've, I've heard what the federal response is to it, and... Uh, I'm not sure that sits that well with me. Uh, I think it might, you know, I, I think so. If the money is used to help the, uh, help the economy, help the people, uh, it works. If it's used to manipulate the economy and the people and like that, then it, it won't work, right? But, uh, until such time as everybody gets their heads together and, and quit looking at the political aspects of it right, and see how it's affecting the entire world and how we can do it in a, a greater sense, then it benefits everybody. It definitely will affect uh, who I'll be voting for depending on what stance they take, but it um, just depends on what they have to say about it. No. No, not at all. Uh, uh, on the whole, I accept the carbon pricing, uh, uh, pr uh, but uh, uh, there are many other issues that uh, I think are uh, more important to me. However, I should tell you, I don't own a car, <laughs> and uh, my bank accounts look uh, much better for not owning a car. Uh, no, it won't, because... Uh you know, I've already, uh, I'm living, uh, attempting to live a low-carbon lifestyle. 
Um, and uh, quite honestly, uh, I, I don't believe that it will impact me that much. I don't drive very much. I walk everywhere. I'm walking right now to the thing I need to do. Uh, and uh, so I don't pay that much for gas, really. Uh, we get the incentive uh, back, uh, which is pretty significant, at least in Ontario. Uh, I think it comes out to like 180 bucks or something like that every quarter or something for, for my family. It's different for everyone. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I support the, uh, the, the carbon uh, pricing. It won't necessarily affect how I vote, but I think the issue of the environment is going to affect how I vote. I think there, you know, it's, it's clear that we need to act more on the environment to, to address environmental concerns. I think that's, that's true and that I think science backs that up. Is carbon taxing the solution out of this issue? I don't know if it is or not. I don't know much about it, but I do think you know action needs to be taken to protect the environment so that we have a planet to live on in, in 50 years and 100 years. Because it's going to happen regardless of what I think. You know, the, yes, it, carbon tax is probably important, but is it is it important enough to overcharge people and then give a rebate that sounds kind of phony? I'd rather just have the true cost, thanks. But it's not going to affect how you vote? No. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Um, from my understanding, it's almost more of an incentive than a tax, you know, it's an incentive for, and, you know, apparently they're, they're going to pay people back, so 80% of people will be better off with the, car, with the carbon tax, 80%, which is most the majority, so, you know, that's the idea is to get an incentive to keep people's, you know, to keep their carbon footprint low, and so the biggest offenders are the ones that pay, pay the most, which are probably the bigger corporations anyway, so. So it doesn't really affect me at all. I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm going to get it back anyway. So, no, it doesn't. Why is that? Because I feel that we have to be aware of the carbon tax, and we've got to do our share. And I know some of us don't have to, won't get any refund, but there's enough that do. What's happening is, it's ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. Like, uh, the Trudeau government, they can't be that naive to think what they're doing isn't affecting every single person in Canada. They're, they're crushing us and it's almost like it's deliberate, like they're doing it on purpose. Like it's just, it's beyond the pale what is going on here. And they stand back and say, we take a thousand from you and give you 1200 back and, and then we're fixing the climate with the leftover money. Well, that's a bunch of crap. Ain't happening. You know, everything that they do, every automobile, every produce, everything that you buy is up. So even if they are getting rebates, it's only touching your own personal stuff, but it's not affecting the, the big picture of everything going up. So it's a farce, an absolute farce. Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGinnis, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.